Welcome to the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology YouTube channel. The topic today is ENT anesthesia, and we're covering the key words over about the last decade on the topic ENT anesthesia, and these are the key words. In green represents those from 2019. They can be kind of grouped together at the top left. You can see laryngeal innervation is important, thyroid surgery and its complications, airway fire and lasers, uh, central sleep apnea versus obstructive sleep apnea, upper respiratory tract infections and airway reactivity, and jet ventilation, gas exchange, as well as complications of jet ventilation are some of the key words that we will cover in this short video cast. Let's start with airway innervation. Cranial nerve number 5, 9, and 10 are involved in airway innervation. And at the bottom right, you can see a light blue, yellow, and red colored uh, representation of cranial nerve number 5 in light blue, cranial nerve number 9 in yellow, and cranial nerve number 10 in the pinkish red. So if you were going to block cranial nerve number 5, nose and nasopharynx, usually we just simply spray a local anesthetic in the nares. Cranial nerve number 9 covers the tongue in the oral pharynx in the upper epiglottis and the gag reflex. So if someone had a really bad gag reflex, we'd need to concentrate on spray as we go in the area represented by yellow in the bottom right. Now occasionally a cranial nerve number 9 nerve block uh, can be done and that nerve can be blocked at the base of the tongue near the tonsillar pillars on each side. It's an uncommon nerve block and simply spray with benzocaine or nebulization of a local anesthetic is often used when, for example, doing an awake fiber optic intubation. Cranial nerve number 10, represented by the reddish pink color on the bottom right, the sensory distribution of it, is the larynx, the lower epiglottis, and below the vocal cords. And cranial nerve number 10 has multiple branches and let's start with the superior laryngeal nerve, a branch of cranial nerve number 10. And on the top right, it's represented by the orangish yellowish color. Superior laryngeal nerve comes down, and the first branch is the internal branch, which pierces the membrane of the thyrohyoid, and the internal branch goes inside and provides sensation above the vocal cords. The external branch continues down, and it supplies one muscle, it's motor to the cricothyroid, and it's a tensor of the uh, vocal cords. All other muscles of the larynx are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, except this one tensor supplied by superior laryngeal nerve, external branch. If we wanted to block the superior laryngeal nerve with a specific nerve block, we could do so up at the point where the internal branch goes through the thyrohyoid membrane, and you have to do that on both sides. Usually, again, we don't do that specific nerve block, but spray topical eyes in the distribution represented uh, by the uh, distribution of that orange nerve, the internal branch of superior laryngeal nerve, which is sensation above the vocal cords. Now, the recurrent laryngeal nerve is represented by green, a branch of the vagus, and it's sensory below the glottis, all the trachea down, and motor to all the muscles of the larynx except the cricothyroid, which was supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve external branch. If we're going to block the recurrent laryngeal nerve, you can do so by injecting a local anesthetic with a needle through the cricothyroid membrane, and as the local anesthetic goes into the trachea, the patient will cough, spreading it up and down the trachea, and block the sensory distribution of that recurrent laryngeal nerve. Oftentimes, we simply nebulize a local anesthetic or spray through a fiber optic scope to uh, anesthetize the distribution of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. If damage to this nerve occurs unilaterally, you can have voice changes and hoarseness, but it's really we worry about when there's a bilateral uh, nerve injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve because if it's injured, the vocal cords may not pull apart and you can have total airway obstruction adducted vocal cords and uh, a patient may after extubation fail extubation immediately and require reintubation and possibly even a tracheostomy. So damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve can cause uh, complete airway obstruction. While damage to the ninth 
uh, or that is the superior laryngeal nerve often just causes a wispy voice. Let's look at laryngeal anatomy in a little bit more detail now. Recurrent laryngeal nerve, a branch of the vagus, supplies all the muscles except that tensor, the cricothyroid, which is supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve external branch. Abduction, or pulling apart of the vocal cords, as represented in the bottom picture with the vocal cords wide open, abduction is supplied by the uh, posterior cricoarachnoids. And the way to understand this is you need to see the posterior cricoarachnoid, the way it wraps around and attaches to the little pivot uh, uh, cartilage here, and when it contracts, pulls on that little pivot and pivots those vocal cords open, as opposed to a deduction or closing of the vocal cords or bringing them together, is the lateral cricoarachnoid muscle, which when it contracts, again, pivots that little uh, cartilage apparatus and the vocal cords go together. Now I wanted to point out the piriform fossa which is represented in the bottom picture uh, with the red circle. The piriform fossa is the area oftentimes when a fiber optic scope is going in and it's too deep and you see a light in the lateral aspect of the neck or using a light wand for intubation for example uh, you can see light in the lateral aspect of the neck when you put uh, gastric tubes in, sometimes they get caught here. That's the piriform fossa. Let's go to thyroidectomy now and some of the complications of thyroidectomy. The first is nerve damage. If you damage that superior laryngeal nerve, which is a branch of the vagus, you can end up with a weak voice with decreased pitch called a whispery voice. Now, the superior laryngeal nerve innervates that one muscle, the cricothyroid, and that's the tensor of the vocal cords. So you can't tense it as well, so you get this whispery voice. But you will not get airway obstruction. Now recurrent laryngeal nerve, if you lose the ability to abduct or pull apart the uh, vocal cords, you can have intact adduction and when you have intact adduction or tensing of those vocal cords, they can be stuck in the paramedian position and you can have possible airway obstruction. So at the top right picture, you can see the vocal cords together, stuck together, uh, and uh, this can potentially cause full airway obstruction. Now, when neck surgery and some uh, thyroid surgery is being done, if you want to monitor for the recurrent laryngeal nerve and try to prevent injury to it, you can use EMG, electromyography. And the tube that is often used for monitoring is shown at the bottom right. And that tube has an area that is a metal plate that sits between the vocal cords and it has wires that go out the top such that if the nerve is irritated or the surgeon is near it and about to damage it. The hope is that the stimulation of that nerve will occur, the vocal cords will contract and close around that little piece of metal uh, in the tube and set off an alarm that tells us, ooh, get away from that nerve, you're about ready to damage it. So you don't want someone paralyzed if you want to be able to monitor the muscles of the larynx. So if you're going to intubate someone and use a neuromuscular monitoring tube, we'd use succinylcholine and let it wear off or no neuromuscular blockade at all for intubation. We'd use a really large tube because eight, eight and a half, maybe even a nine tube, you want contact of that tube with the vocal cord. So a very small tube, you might not get good contact. Also, don't use local anesthetic on the tube like viscous lidocaine or anything like that or don't use a, a spray of a local anesthetic on the vocal cords because obviously then they may not contract and set off the alarm if the surgeon is near the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Another complication of thyroid surgery is parathyroid injury. A little parathyroid sitting on the back of the thyroid and if you damage those you can get acute hypocalcemia. Uh, usually occurs within the first day to two days after surgery on the thyroid. Very small percentage of patients. 
but those patients may get laryngeal stridor and spasm. They can get tingling in their lips and fingertips, uh, spasm of uh, uh, muscles in their face when you tap on the seventh cranial nerve, that Schaufstick sign, and if you blow up a blood pressure cuff on their arm, they can get spasm of their hand, and they can even get QT prolongation from the hypocalcemia that results. The management of acute uh, parathyroid injury and acute hypocalcemia is intravenous calcium and airway management such as CPAP or possibly even intubation may be necessary. Another complication of thyroidectomy is a neck hematoma. If you have an expanding hematoma, uh, potentially the airway can be impacted and even deviated so uh, much from midline that it may be near impossible to intubate a patient, open the incision, uh, get the hematoma out, get the NT surgeon there. You may even need to do an awake intubation um, um, uh, to manage uh, this airway rather than putting them to sleep and paralyzing them and then finding out that the airway is so deviated you can't see anything and then you're really in trouble. So neck hematoma, consider opening the incision, let the hematoma out, let the airway come back to midline and uh, with the NT surgeon there uh, decide what to do next. Lasers and airway fire, the next uh, keyword topic. To decrease the risk of laser-generated airway fire, one of the things that you can do is use an endotracheal tube that doesn't burn, basically. A flexible stainless steel shown on the far right. That would be the most resistant to laser, as opposed to a PVC, red rubber, or silicon endotracheal tube. So a laser-resistant tube, stainless steel, some of those have a dual cuff on them, shown at the far right and such that if one of the cuffs is hit by the laser, at least you got another cuff that works. Sometimes you can put saline with methylene blue dye in, uh, in the cuff, such that, that if it is hit by the laser, the methylene blue is distributed into the airway, and you can see, huh, the cuff must have been hit by the laser. Um, and also remember to moisten exposed surfaces like saline, soap, gauze. That can help prevent uh, flammability of the airway, and often will pack the posterior pharynx with saline soaked gauze. But a tube that's stainless steel, that can reduce the flammability. Reduce FiO2, less than 30% is typical. Adding helium, very rarely. But avoid nitrous oxide because it can support combustion. Another way to reduce risk of a laser generated airway fire is get the flammable material out of the airway. So sometimes you can do anesthesia without an endotracheal tube. For example, an apneic technique or a jet technique. One example is small endotracheal tube that goes in, you ventilate the patient, you pull the endotracheal tube out and let the surgeon uh, begin lasering for several minutes. When the patient desaturates, put the small endotracheal tube back in and ventilate the patient back up. Management of airway fire, uh, we should follow the ASA practice advisory and I'll show that in a slide next, but if you have a fire with a tube in place, immediately without waiting, remove that tracheal tube, stop the flow of all airway gases, flood the surgical field with saline if there's a fire, reestablish ventilation, and consider bronchoscopy uh, to look at what damage has occurred to the airway and uh, potentially if there's pieces of endotracheal tube in the airway. Airway fire prevention is another key word. This is the ASA practice advisory, and up at the top of it is fire prevention techniques. One, avoid using ignition sources in proximity to an oxidizer-enriched atmosphere. In other words, a bovie, electrocautery. And if you have surgical drapes, try to keep them away from where you're uh, bovying. And if you have some type of skin prep that is flammable, be careful, let it dry and sponges and gauze that are near the, where you're firing the laser, moisten them. If it's a high risk procedure, we can follow the algorithm down and realize that this is a team that's working together to try to prevent a fire. And you should talk about the risk, notify the surgeon of the presence of an increase of an oxidizer enriched atmosphere. That is, if your FiO2 is high, use a cuffed endotracheal tube for surgery in the airway such that, that uh, oxygen-enriched um, gases uh, may not leak out into the area where the laser is firing. Uh, use laser-resistant tracheal tubes like stainless steel and where you're doing MAC with moderate to deep sedation. Consider uh, a laryngeal mask airway 
which can prevent some of those gases from getting up into the area where the actual laser is being used or electrocautery is being used. Before an ignition source is activated, the surgeon should announce intent to use it. We should do our best to reduce the oxygen concentration to the minimum required to avoid hypoxia, and we should not be using nitrous oxide. If we follow that algorithm down, if there's a fire present, and it's an airway fire, that is, there's something in the airway like a tube that's beginning to burn, the first thing is to remove the tracheal tube, then stop the flow of gases, remove sponges or anything else that's flammable in the airway, and pour saline into the airway to extinguish it. Now, if it's a non-airway fire, for example, plastic surgery around the face, someone had nasal cannula oxygen on, and the oxygen accumulated under the drape, and the plastic surgeon used electrocautery on the face and a fire occurred, the first thing to do is stop the flow of all airway gases, then remove the drapes and extinguish the burning material. So you can see there's a difference between the first step in an airway fire, which is remove the tracheal tube, and the first step in a non-airway fire, which is stop the flow of airway gases. Let's go to common laser types, risks, and safety next. Carbon dioxide and YAG lasers are the two we'll mainly focus on. Carbon dioxide lasers have a limited penetration. They don't go very deep. The energy is absorbed by tissue water. Superficial injury uh, occurs if you were struck by that laser. And we protect our eyes with clear goggles are okay because a corneal injury is what would occur if that laser happened to hit our eyes or potentially could occur corneal because it has limited penetration. While a YAG laser goes deeper, greater penetration can cause a retinal injury, and tinted goggles are the ones that are needed to protect you from the YAG laser. Those type of laser is frequently used to debulk tumors, to coagulate bleeding uh, tumors, and removing uh, obstructions that are in the airway. The next topic is obstructive sleep apnea, predicting it, and polysomnography or sleep studies. Top right shows a patient who's asleep and the uh, tissue in the posterior pharynx is fallen back and totally obstructing the airway. And this patient is likely to have many episodes of apnea and hypopnea if they had a polysomnography exam or sleep study. Obstructive sleep apnea is associated with hypertension, both systemic and pulmonary hypertension, coronary disease, heart failure, arrhythmias, and even stroke. In the pre-op clinic, if you see a patient who's undergoing some type of surgery and you're worried that they might have obstructive sleep apnea, the stop-bang score can help us predict the risk. So let's look at the stop-bang score up at the top right. The stop questionnaire is, do you snore? Are you tired during the day? Does someone observe you stop breathing at night and gasp? Do they have a high blood pressure? S-T-O-N-P. And then the bang portion is B, high body mass index greater than 35, age, A greater than 50, neck circumference, a thick neck, and a male gender. These are at-risk answers to the questionnaire, and if there are more than three of those, uh, we need to think about sending them for a sleep testing if they have not been diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea or aren't currently using a CPAP device. Now, polysomnography or sleep study is shown at the bottom right. And in a sleep study, the EEG is monitored, the top waveform, electromyelogram for muscle activity, airflow through the, uh, through the uh, nasal and oral uh, airway, thoracic movement, abdominal movement, oxygen saturation, and the electrocardiogram. In red shows a period of apnea where there is no flow of air through the nasal or oral airway. And when there's no flow and there's that period of apnea, the EEG arousal occurs. It's like patients suddenly awakening, they gasp, there is thoracic movement, abdominal movement, and desaturation has already occurred. And if desaturation is bad enough, you can even have bradycardia. This is what is being monitored during a sleep study. And apnea hypopnea index is calculated, or AHI, which is the sum of the number of apneas, or pauses in breathing, plus the number of hypopneas, which are periods of shallow breathing, and that's averaged per hour. So for example, if you had an eight hour period of a sleep study 
and you had uh, 80 of those, that would be 10 per hour and you would be in the mild range. Or let's say you had um, um, a couple of them per hour, well that would be normal. Less than 5 per hour on average is considered normal. So you can see 5 to 15 is mild, 15 to 30 is moderate, and greater than 30 of these AHI events during a polysomnography study is considered severe obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea versus obesity hypoventilation syndrome was another key word. OSA first, top right. Males tend to predominate. Um, the ventilation pattern tends to be normal at night, except when they have those periods of apnea and they gasp. They don't have a buildup in CO2, and uh, they normally don't have a low PaO2 except during the periods of apnea. They make choking or gasping uh, uh, noises during their sleep and they will often awaken frequently during sleep and their partners say that they snore terribly and awaken frequently and they're often tired and those are the ones that have that stop bang score that's high. And when they have more than five of these obstructive breathing events per hour or AHI, we say that that is significant. Now, obesity hypoventilation syndrome is where while they're asleep, the CO2 actually builds up but they don't breathe faster. It's like the brainstem's not responding to that increase in CO2, and PaO2 often goes down and is most severe during REM sleep. Saturation goes down, and they don't have the typical upper airway obstruction unless they have coexisting OSA. So it's like, what's going on here? Their CO2 is building up, their oxygen's going down. Why aren't they breathing more? Why aren't they sensing it and breathing faster? and they can have pulmonary hypertension related to this chronic hypoxia and hypercarbia and when you monitor them you look for that increased CO2 during sleep to greater than 10 millimeters from an awake supine value and oxygen desaturation during sleep that's not explained by apnea or hypopnea. That's the difference between OHS and OSA. The next keyword is URI and airway reactivity. Bronchial hyperreactivity can occur for up to six weeks following a URI, and usually these are viral upper respiratory tract infections. And often this is a problem when you're looking at a pediatric patient who's going to have a surgery and they have had a recent cold and you wonder, should I uh, anesthetize them? Should I put this surgery off? There is increased perioperative risk of laryngospasm, bronchospasm, coughing, and desaturation if they've had a recent URI. And predictors of adverse respiratory events include if they've had a URI and they're undergoing airway surgery, they have a history of asthma and have signs like wheezing or rock eye that don't clear with a cough, they're exposed to secondary smoke, or they have purulent or productive secretions. So airway reactivity can occur, uh, hyperreactivity can last up to six weeks following a viral URI. In the last grouping of keywords, I put some miscellaneous ones here. The first is jet ventilation and complications of such. At the top right is shown a suspension laryngoscopy with, at the blue arrow, a jet uh, where uh, usually oxygen is being insufflated under high pressure and in training by Venturi effect the air that's around the, in the pharynx. So jet ventilation is used during airway surgery and oxygenization is usually not a big problem, but ventilation isn't the greatest and CO2 tends to build up and that's one of the complications of jet ventilation, hypoventilation. Also there's a risk, although it be it quite rare, of pneumomediastinum or pneumothorax. That is if you're jetting under high pressure, Potentially, if there was open uh, incision, for example, in the posterior pharynx somewhere, or it was under really high pressure, you could blow air uh, into the mediastinum or into uh, and cause a pneumothorax or a pneumomediastinum. So jet ventilation complications, buildup of CO2, air in places that it shouldn't be, such as the mediastinum and in the pleural. Carotid sinus reflex. If Surgery is occurring about the neck and you manipulate the carotid sinus. For example, during a neck dissection, patient can become bradycardic. This is typical during carotid endarterectomy, but any neck surgery where you have pressure on the carotid sinus can result in this bradycardia. It is a ninth cranial nerve afferent and tenth 
efferent reflux from the carotid sinus to the brainstem and back to the heart, resulting in bradycardia. Simply infiltration, a, uh, infiltrating a local anesthetic like lidocaine around the carotid sinus can block it. Nitrous oxide, we're going to avoid that in certain types of surgeries, middle ear surgery being one of those, tympanic grafts, Lafort 2 and 3 fractures. If someone has one of those types of fractures, uh, it's frequently associated with basilar skull fractures, dural tears, and putting a tube or a gastric tube uh, into the nares is contraindicated. So, in summary, these are the key words over the last decade or so. Innervation of the larynx, complications after thyroid surgery, airway fires and preventing them, and uh, obstructive sleep apnea, airway reactivity, and some complications, as well as gas exchange during jet ventilation. This ends this short keyword review on ENT topics, and I hope you have a wonderful day.